Welcome to the Effective Statistician with Alexander Schacht and Benjamin Pieske, the weekly podcast for statisticians in the health sector designed to improve your leadership skills, widen your business acumen and enhance your efficiency. In today's episode, we'll chat about the 2018 PSI conference. I will share what are my best takeaways, key takeaways from this uh, conference, which was a really, really nice, great conference beginning of June in Amsterdam. So I will talk about what sessions I attended, what I learned from them, as well as some interviews with some interesting guests and speakers from the conference. So stay tuned. This podcast is sponsored by PSI, a global member organization dedicated to leading and promoting best practice and industry initiatives. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to special interest groups, the video on demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars and much, much more. Visit the PSI website at psiweb.org to learn more about PSI activities and become a PSI member. Hey, this is Alexander Schacht with a new episode of the Effective Statistician. And this time, it's the first time that I'm recording this completely alone are actually not completely alone on a special topic. And this special topic is the 2018 PSI conference that happened early June in Amsterdam. And I want to give you a little bit of a summary from my perspective, my personal perspective on this pretty amazing conference that had lots of goals into it. So if you have missed the conference, then maybe you can get a little bit of a sense of what the conference was about and also a little bit of the learnings from the conference. Thanks a lot to Lucy Rowell, who um, helped me with, with this in terms of um, saying that's completely okay to repeat it here. And I hope that also this gives you a little bit of a flavor of the PSI conference if you haven't yet attended one and you sign up for the next one. This year there will be, uh, again, of course, abstract submissions later this year. So have already some thoughts about what you might want to submit um, to your um, as as an oral presentation or a poster presentation, because that always helps to get, for example, travel approval and these kind of things easier. Okay, so the conference kicked off with um, keynote speech by Nupur Kohli, who is the um, expert in the future of healthcare coming directly from the Netherlands, where the conference was. And she uh, talked about the future of healthcare, trends, opportunities, and challenges. And of course, it's quite difficult to kind of speak about the future, but um, she talked about a couple of trends that help us to kind of extrapolate into the future. And some key learnings for me were, or some key highlights were, that information on health and education becomes more and more important, especially as across the world, um, all the people get older, all the populations get older, and we have more and more patients with chronic diseases. Um, also, data becomes more and more connected in the health uh, sector, and there's more and more apps out there that help you to better interpret your data or make some you know, decisions based on your data or help you to make decisions based on your data. But we don't currently have anything to distinguish the good from the ugly. So there's, it's very, very hard for the um, consumer to see what's a quality application and what's actually um, pretty bad and doesn't really kind of uh, tell you the right things based on the data. Also, I think the patients will take more responsibility in the future, 
more and more responsibility already now. So we move much more toward a co-decision making between the physician and, and the patient. And I guess in some cases, maybe just a patient decision. Um, and with all this data and this connectivity, um, she talked that, you know, maybe we move from purely healthcare companies to much more kind of technology companies. And I think there is already some trends in there that some of the big players in the tech space uh, enter into healthcare. Okay, and then I went to, uh, there were a couple of sessions at, uh, actually after that, um, where it was very, very hard for me to decide where to go. Um, there was uh, one workshop where I was really, really interested to go. It was about owning your own development. But as I couldn't attend it, I interviewed Nelson Kinnersley. And here's the interview. So I'm standing here with Nelson uh, Kinnersley. And he this morning ran a session about owning your own development. Uh, for me, I think it's a quite important topic. What actually led you to have such a session? Uh, thanks, Alexander. Yeah, and uh, certainly um, it was not just myself. must also uh, uh, credit uh, Margaret and uh, Gemma for um, their workshop as well. Um, but uh, yes, you're right, I did open it with a few of my observations from various roles that I've had as a statistician, both as an individual contributor, but also managing teams as well. And I think that, you know... It, in our formal education, there's very little coverage of many of these areas of leaderships. And I think as the audience saw um, that we're working through that at Roche and we have come up with 14 skills that we believe statisticians can be most successful in addition to their more technical skills. Um, and why do you title it Owning Your Own Development? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, so... Um, one of the things which um, is certainly often talked about is what's the role of the individual, what's the role of the manager, what's the role of the organisation. And what I was briefly laying out were certainly one can rely on some of the organisation and some of the things with your manager. But for this to be truly successful, I and I'm sure others believe um, that you have a role to play. And so some of the things I was, I was describing were what are the uh, actions, what are some of the tactics that you can take to actually be successful and take accountability for some of your own developments in terms of non-technical or soft skills. And if you would give our listeners one kind of key takeaway from this session, what would that be? Wow, you do ask tough questions. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, key I think, you know, by the end of the workshop session, I, I think they, um, particularly Margaret and Gemma's examples showed how sometimes we forget about the big picture. It, it's quite easy or maybe it's quite tempting to jump in and feel that you've been asked a question, jump in with uh, your, your action plan, but often pausing and wondering actually what's the big picture. What are the big decisions that might be taken by our work can actually help you in the long run and certainly in a team environment they can help you in the long run. So first thinking it through a little bit more and uh, seeing how, how kind of my specific work fits into the overall as a strategy of the overall team and connecting these to the bigger picture. I certainly agree with that and also if necessary clarifying because often we get questions and we maybe don't fully understand the context and I think as part of the workshop what we were hearing was do take that time and then get that bigger picture and then take your accountability seriously work on your deliverables and hopefully with the rest of the team you can be successful okay thanks a lot Nelson thanks Alexander so this was the interview with Nelson which session I couldn't attend unfortunately Instead, I actually went to see uh, not just another AE table session. And behind this session is actually mostly it was about um, 
benefit-risk analysis. Um, there were three of the four presentations were coming from members of the benefit-risk special interest group, and that was a contributed session. Um, Alberto Garcia Hernandez made a very, very nice presentation about addressing intercurrent events with a treatment policy strategy in survival analysis. So he showed kind of how you can use flow diagrams to highlight the different flow of the data for the different intercurrent events and uh, showed how you can use then uh, inverse probability weighting to manage the censoring. Uh, there was also a little bit about the discussion with these weights. For certain patients, you get may get in certain situations very, very extreme weights. So they get an overly emphasis and a lot of impact on the analysis. One way to actually deal with these kind of um, weighting problem, and I think this is similar to lots of different other areas where you can where you have these re-weighting of patients. Um, for example, also in matching adju matching adjusted indirect comparisons, or in you know propensity rescoring, or a couple of these other things where you re-weight patients. Um, you always have these problems with these very, very impactful patients. And one way um, to address that, which I think is very, very clever, is to um, put different caps into your analysis. And of course, you know, where you put this cap, so, so let's say you don't allow the patients to have a weight of more than two or more than three or more than five or more than ten, and um, you can basically um, do sensitivity analysis for these kind of things and show how the cap actually changes, um, changes the results. So you can see at least how robust your data are with respect to these very, very inf influential uh, patients. Um, Of course, you know, one of these topics within the uh, benefit-risk session was also about uh, preference elicitation and, um, um, for example, using discrete choice experiments. And currently, every company is more or less doing their own studies there. However, for, for, for certain indications where there's lots of research and it's let's say, rather stable in terms of what kind of um, variables and attributes you need for such experiments, it would be great to have something like company-independent results. So some kind of indication standard for, for weights. I think that would help a lot <clears throat> to make patient preferences more being applied across the industry. The last, um, yeah, I think the last presentation in this session was by Maria Costa, and she talked about personalized benefit risk assessment. And for that, I have another interview. So now I'm standing here with Maria Costa. She is the chair of the SIG for benefit risk, and she gave a very interesting presentation about personalized benefit risk approaches. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the key takeaways from your presentation? Hi, oh, thank you so much, Alexander, for um, your interest in the presentation. So I would say that uh, our interest uh, in this topic spiked because uh, we started uh, discussing the, the problem that it's uh, when you do a benefit risk assessment, it's not always the case that uh, one size fits all. And, um, and so we started thinking about how could we uh, help doctors make a decision uh, on which medicine to prescribe for a patient with certain characteristics. So uh, with that in mind, we developed uh, an algorithm where you say, okay, given your uh, specific uh, characteristics, typically referred to as covariates, what is the probability that a treatment that is known to um, 
work only in a specific subgroup by design. You know, this is for obviously in a simulated um, setting. What is the probability that that treatment uh, provides uh, a positive benefit risk? So we are still very much in the early stages. Uh, I think what I would like people to take uh, home is that it is important to think about benefit risk from um, as a very heterogeneous and complex problem. And that heterogeneity obviously uh, can also come from the fact that patients themselves are different and that we should try as much as possible to target uh, our medicines to the uh, individual patient characteristics. We are still very much in early stages. Uh, I had very nice conversations with people during the coffee breaks here at PSI and have a couple of ideas on uh, what to do next. So, yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, and I think that fits very well with the kind of overall topics that we had during this uh, session where also Daniel Saurer presented about subgroup analysis based on the patient preferences, mm -hmm. so not on the biologic kind of characteristics of the patients and pretreatment and stuff like this, but more kind of on the personal preferences and on trade-offs between benefits and risks. So I think the uh, two layers in terms of the heterogeneity, it's on the um, biologic mm -hmm. kind of things, as well on the personal preferences where you can basically define and it's good patient patient-based benefit-risk decisions. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned that because, as you know, we uh, also had a, a hands-on workshop on preference elicitation. And what I liked about that, uh, the, the conversations that took place there was that uh, through the, the, the interactive tool, um, it was very clear which, uh, in our simulated you know, s setting, which drugs performed well on which criteria. And therefore, if you have a patient that has certain specific preferences or because of their more biological characteristics, maybe this person is more frail, etc., etc., you can then say, okay, if this drug performs better on the safety side, then if this patient is more frail and they don't really want to have any comorbidities associated with the treatment, then you know that you are making, you are making a more informed uh, decision. So I think that's really interesting how everything ties together. Yeah, thanks a lot, Maria. Welcome, thank you. The next session I attended was a workshop and was a workshop that was organized by the Benefit Risk Special Interest Group You see, I have a little bit of bias regarding benefit risk uh, because I've been the chair of that SIG. And the, um, that was a hands-on workshop on preference elicit elicitation in the age of personalized medicine. It was a really, really great workshop with um, an int introduction to swing baiting, which is a particular method to elicitate these patient preferences. And uh, there was a case study presented um, for everybody to kind of understand. Also, um, then, uh, an introduction into actually how to do swing weighting. It's a very, very easy technique that you can use. And then all the different tables were given different perspectives. So one um, table was a payer, one pa uh, table was a patient perspective, there was physician perspective, regulatory perspective. And then people really kind of dived into this role play and thought about their personas and then had a really, really good discussion about how they wanted to um, weigh the different uh, attributes. And um, not unsurprisingly, all the different tables came up with very, very different ratings. And I think that is quite good to understand that different stakeholders will have different perceptions about how to um, assign trade-off weights between efficacy or different efficacy endpoints as well as efficacy versus safety endpoints. Then I went into another session um, that was very, very, 
of course, uh, good, good, um, um, good attended, well attended, and that was the estimates case study. Estimates, of course, one of the hot topics of this conference. There were a couple of uh, presentations about that. One was about um, a specific working group in Alzheimer's disease uh, that um, looked into how to best come up with uh, estimates in, in this setting, also kind of for uh, studies that look into the more milder forms of the disease. And of course, there's, um, these Alzheimer studies are very, very long-term studies due to the slow progression of the disease. And therefore, lots of things can happen in these um, um, long-term studies. Um, Another very, very good presentation in this estimates case studies was about um, the con com composite estimate strategy uh, in confirmatory clinical trials given by Oliver Keen. And what I loved about this presentation was that he showed that um, this composite approach is usually thought of as you do a binary approach. You are a non-responder if you drop out and you're a responder if, if you're still on treatment and, and are actually a responder on some kind of different scale. But he showed that, well, actually you can also, you know, depending on the intercurrent event, you can have different... Uh, ways to categorize you. So um, an AE or loss of response might be something different than, for example, if, if, if you die or if you um, drop out of the study for um, because just you need to move the city and you can't continue with the study. So that, I think, was very, very good to have more kind of more categories in terms of this composite approach. Um, then, of course, you kind of have the problems that you don't have a binary endpoint, but you have a, maybe an ordered categorical endpoint. And for that, there's a couple of non-parametric ways to, um, to analyze that. And there's lots of research by uh, Professor Brunner and his colleagues from Göttingen that has published on that. So if you look for uh, publications yeah, with Brunner on it, Edgar Brunner, you'll find all the different things in it. He has published with various authors on this topic and this says lots about how to analyze such, such data. So that was a um, very, very good one. And uh, the last uh, presentation in this session was by Louisa Berggren. And I'm not talking too much about this today because that will be uh, next week's episode. I have her as a guest. After that, uh, we had the poster review session, Gone in 60 Seconds is the title, where all the different um, poster presenters had 60 sec seconds to present and pitch their uh, poster. And it was a plenary session and it was very well attended and it was really a lot of fun. So there were um, lots of people coming up with very, very good well-prepared short presentations of their posters that really pitched people to come to their poster. And there were also a couple of people that made an extra effort to stand out from the crowd because, of course, there were lots of 60-second uh, poster reviews. And if you want to stand out from the crowd, you need to do a little bit of extra work. So that was also a lot of fun. And regarding the poster session, I have another interview. Okay, and now I'm standing here with a, one of the winners of the poster um, exhibition, uh, Dr. Jules Hernandez Sanchez, and he got a award about his very, very nice poster about alternatives to comparing survival curves at the median. So what are your kind of key takeaways? What are the key takeaways from this poster? 
Hi, yes. thank you, Alexander. And it was a very surprise, very nice surprise, actually. I wasn't expecting to win anything. It's my first conference as well. Um, so I was involved in a project where we based all our inferences in median differences. And I, for that particular project, it was okay because there was no difference in the treatment versus the standard uh, control arm. But, uh, but if, if um, what happens if the curves, the survival curves, are very close at the median, but different anywhere else. If you base your mm -hmm. est est estimate, your inference on the median difference, you would say there is nothing going on. But if you look at the curves, there is a lot of things going on. So I proposed four to apply simultaneously for four different statistics, which are very simple. They're out there already, log rank test, pairwise um, generalized comparisons by Buys, you can Google it. Uh, restricted mean squares, um, survival time, and um, something I came up with, which is a hodges Lehman estimate of the difference between medians. And it's a very simple implementation. I mean, you can have a lot more sophisticated methods. In, in fact, next to me, there were two posters with a lot more sophisticated methods. But what happens is when you go back home, you don't implement them. And this is very simple. And every test extracts a different amount of information from the comparison in curves, and you start gaining more uh, insight into them. Um, and for instance, restricted mean survival times tells you the uh, average life expectancy up to a certain point. Pairwise com generalized comparisons compares every single time from one arm against the other and t t gives you a proportion of which arm has more uh, in favor than against, etc., etc. So you propose to always, if you want to display some differences in the means, to also display all these exactly, other things exactly. together. You, so you would power your study for one analysis, main analysis. Um, but you want to describe your exactly, overall... Exactly. You can, you can complement that main analysis with these four estimates. And it, uh, it gives you a lot more information. Different overlapping information, not exactly the same, but they, they start building a statistical a uh, uh, picture of the of what you see. Very nice. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you, Alexander. Fun was also the uh, networking event in the evening. So we had a, a very, very nice um, restaurant bar directly uh, at the water, the Hennekin Spooms. It was in walking distance from the, um, from the conference center. And it was really great uh, meeting old friends and also getting to know some new folks. So that was very, very, very nicely organized from the conference as well. The next morning, um, there was another plenary uh, session um, where uh, Steve Ruberg, formerly Lilly, now uh, has his own one-man show company, um, is uh, talked about statistics and data science. Is six the same as half dozen? And that was a very, very, very good presentation. So Steve Rugeberg has built a complete kind of, yeah, what you many would call a data science department with, within Lilly. And he talked a lot about uh, these kind of areas where you can have an impact as a statistician beyond drug development. <laughs> and he challenged the uh, organizers of the uh, uh, conference uh, that choose the title uh, Breaking Boundaries in Drug Development. Maybe they have sh we should have chosen Breaking Boundaries Beyond Drug Development. So that was very, very nice. It was very thought-provoking in terms of that we need to step outside of our kind of comfort zone, that we need to look more into these kind of spaces beyond clinical research. And he bolstered that with a couple of examples from uh, pretty prominent examples also from Google and, and other kind of prominent players where they had bad examples of data science <clears throat> that in the beginning looked very, very promising, but actually turned out to be complete flukes. So he really asked us as statisticians in the healthcare sector to step up and go beyond. And what was also very, very nice of him, he um, showed how he actually did that within Lilly. So he shared a couple of examples how he 
carved out some uh, resources, put it onto projects, um, made a success, created further demand that led to more resources and through that kind of really, really established that. So he had all the different kind of um, features of a change initiatives in his presentation and he talked to them uh, why you need all these kind of different features of change management in order to um, yeah come up with a robust plan and a kind of a strategy. He talked also about the vision that you need to have in order to, to get there and, uh, and these kind of different things. Very, very rounded presentation. Um, lots of um, applause afterwards and I heard lots of very, very, very good feedback about that. After that, I went into another workshop. So there were actually a couple of really, really nice workshops uh, in this. And this one was about another of my favorite talk um, topics, which I actually only discovered afterwards. So, so the workshop was called Improving Your Communication. Um, and they had some really, really nice, so to say, games that showed the people on the games the power of graphical presentations, the power of figures. So there was one game where uh, the different tables were given all the same data and then the tables were asked to compete to get some kind of uh, features from the data, you know, the, the maximum or the minimum or things like that. And so some tables always kind of first and much faster than the other tables. And I was sitting in these lower tables and said, wow, how are they make, uh, doing this? They're so fast. And only later it was revealed that some of the tables were given um, just the, yeah, the results tables, you know, that we usually have in our clinical studies. And some had graphical representations of these. And of course, the tables with the graphs were much faster. Very, very nicely done. Um, also about kind of um, what to look into the different graphs, uh, what to take care of. Perfect. Very, very nicely done by um, uh, Gemma Hudson, who presented that. Um, as well as a couple of uh, other people uh, helping her. Great job. The next session, I was actually the chair and I organized this invited session about patient centricity. And it was an um, invited session on the topic of uh, benefit risk. One presentation I would like to expand a little bit more on that was um, an update from Prefer, which is actually an IMI project looking into patient preferences and patient preference elicitation. And Chiara Vicello actually did a very, very nice presentation about the first outcomes of this um, prefer IMI pro project. She talked about how to categorize all these different patient preference elicitation approaches and um, which recommendations the team came up with how to use this. So I think this will be really, really important because that basically sets standards for the industry in the future. And I think in the future, <clears throat> we will need to follow these guidance um, because it's a pretty broad expertise that was there. And if we deviate from it, we probably need to um, argue um, and, and uh, discuss it why we deviate from it. So I think it's... Um, I'm not sure whether I would call it a points to consider document, but it probably goes into that direction. So if you work on patient preferences or if you 
I think I would encourage you to have a look into that if you work in track development. Um, have a look into the updates from uh, Prefer. That was the last session I attended that day. And in the evening, we had the gala dinner. The gala dinner was actually at the same place where also the conference was. Actually a beautiful uh, building. It's a very, very old building in the center of Amsterdam that had these amazing rooms, really, really large rooms. I think one of the last uh, royal um, weddings were also there. And so obviously really great location but not only a great location also food was very very good and afterwards there was a really really nice big party so lots of people dancing lots of people making party up to really really late and it was great for for uh, meeting friends and having lots of fun the next morning uh, we started a little bit later with conference due to the gala dinner knowing to take a little bit longer so people have a decent time to rest and we also started with um, a little bit of a different session so the session was about what matters most is scientific advice role play so we had a couple of uh, folks um, on the podium at the, um, at the conference um, I was one of them, and all of them presented different stakeholders. Steve Ruhlberg actually made a great patient, and um, he talked about his experience with uh, these kind of patients because he specifically interviewed a couple of them. And what I found really interesting is that um, he figured out all these patients were always talking in conditional terms if i take the treatment then what do i expect so they were kind of very very much looking into the estimate framework from this conditional point of view which i thought was really really interesting because i personally was thinking very very differently um I took actually the viewpoint of the HDA person, um, given my kind of background where I'm working. And um, as because of that, I, of course, was very, very vocal about the treatment policy. Um, and of course, I'm not an you know, I'm not employed by an HDA body, so it's you know, just imagination of what could happen and also of course to have a little bit of controversy there i also challenge people a little bit to think about safety and efficacy um, and having similar estimates there or maybe even the same estimates there uh, from a kind of uh, intercurrent uh, treatment strategy perspective from a population perspective of course not from a variable and from a, a measure point of view perspective but it these kind of estimates need to be somehow consistent across all the different endpoints that i want to make a kind of summary statement across so if i look into kind of what are also pros of this compound versus another active compound. What are all the negative things of this compound versus compound I have already in the market? So if I sum that up, I need to somehow have a consistent estimate approach because otherwise I think it's really difficult to kind of come up with a conclusion statement in terms of the benefit risk assessment or the added benefit this new drug has and will have in the marketplace of course there was no agreement between all the different stakeholders not surprisingly and <laughs> see, see the regulatory uh, point of view um, was more kind of on an, on treatment estimate and um, 
there was also some discussions about, okay, what should be your primary estimate for the secondary estimate? So, so, you know, the primary one being for the regulators and you can still have other estimates specified, uh, uh, pre-specified as um, secondary analysis, which most HDA bodies would be completely fine with. Just have them pre-specified. And as Muna actually led uh, this session and shared this session, I also interviewed her. I'm standing here with Muna, and Muna has led lots of activities around the estimates topics. And um, also at this conference, she was quite prominently in sharing sessions on this. So Muna, what are your key takeaways from these estimate sessions? Uh, thank you, Alexander, for the kind introduction. So I guess my main takeaways are, firstly, that the topic is still very hot. So we had actually quite a few sessions around estimates. One was specifically um, about case studies. So that's something that we heard at last year's conference, that people wanted to see more tangible examples that they can relate to. So we saw very nice discussions in the context of Alzheimer's disease oncology, but also in, in HTA discussions. So it sort of broadened the view, I would say, at this conference compared to last year's conference, but also conferences that I've seen outside. Secondly, I think one point that was that repeatedly came up, first of all in the case study session, but also in the session on non-proportional hazards, was that there is still a lot of discussion and thinking, I think, needed for um, estimates in the time to event setting. Okay. So some points that were raised were around the value of the hazard ratio, for example, as a summary measure. That is, I think, um, a hot topic and I think it will become uh, more and more of a discussion topic for us, but also for, I assume, regulatory agencies. So what would be the alternative? Well, I mean, There are quite a few alternatives out there, right? So the hazard ratio is just one way of summarizing the treatment difference between two survival curves. And alternatives were published, for example, the restricted mean survival, or you could look at the difference of survival curves at a certain time point. And some of these alternative summary measures may be more flexible, let's say. They may not rely as, uh, or they do not rely on the proportional hazards assumption as the hazard ratio actually does. And um, in fact, there were a couple of publications which are not that recent. So there's a paper called The Hazard of Hazard Ratios by Hernan, for example, and um, Arlen and, and Cook have published a paper on this as well. And so this notion that the hazard ratio may not have a causal interpretation itself um, starts to keep coming up in the literature and I think we in the pharmaceutical industry will sort of um, have to face those challenges and at least discuss it. If there's no issue at the end and we can still use the hazard ratio, that's great. If you will have to look for alternatives, then I think this conference was a good starting point for that because we have actually connected these two topics a bit at this conference. And this also sort of brings me to the third uh, new aspect, or let's say one aspect that is related to estimates which I think is very nice. So we had a pre-conference course on causal inference. We also had a whole session on causal inference uh, yesterday. Um, so on the Monday, the first day of the conference. And I think what's nice about this is that while causal inference or the word causal itself was not mentioned in the ICH9 addendum, this idea of actually causal inference beyond ITT and randomization is something that I think the ICH9 addendum has brought a bit more to our world in the pharmaceutical industry. And it's very nice to see that the PSI is actually picking this up and including training courses, but also relevant sessions in this conference so that most of us who are not that familiar with the topic can actually have a glimpse. It was, was already done maybe at other companies, what type of estimates people look at and also how maybe we can expand our toolkit, but partly also to see that some of the tools that we already know, we can in fact use for, for some of this. What for me was kind of um, a difference here was this causal inference in the estimates frames, framework, 
because for me, working on phase three, uh, phase four for quite some time, having doing observational mm -hmm. studies, all this kind of propensity scoring and uh, inverse probability weighting was something no. that I was used to, mm -hmm. but to the observational study setting yeah. and not to the randomized, randomized clinical mm. trial setting. And so I think that's, that's yeah. quite new. That's a very good point, and I think a lot of these discussions actually come through the notion of this intercurrent event and the appreciation that these are not a complication, they are not a nuisance, they are sort of part of the picture. And I think, I mean, there's a paper by Hernan, and I keep quoting him, but I think there's a very nice paper by him, which is essentially saying that after randomization, as soon as people start dropping out for lack of efficacy or adverse events or start taking another medication, Randomization is sort of lost for certain estimates that you may be looking at. So I think the paper is entitled something along the lines of randomized studies analyzed as observational studies. Yeah, I was just thinking that way, yeah. yeah. And I think there are, there are a lot of connections there. And um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the methods and thinking that has been, um, let's say, maybe more standard in, in observational studies, uh, late stage studies, real world evidence, may become something that we want to look at as well. Yeah, not, because, I mean, because the basically studies are not going away, but in yeah, addition but, to that. But over time, the more dropouts you have, the more your study becomes kind of observational. Yeah. In, in a sense, of course, not in a sense from a kind of legal perspective, but just from a kind of how the data looks and feels. Yeah. So why do we do randomization? Right? We do randomization to get balanced groups such that at the end of the day, if I'm only changing treatment in both groups, if something changes at the end, I know it must be because of the treatment. But now, as you said, when you have dropout and all these other intercurrent events happening, you have a lot of other selection processes going on, and whatever you now see at the end, you're not as certain anymore as it's because of the treatment that's actually taken. So, yeah, it's creating a whole lot of new, uh, let's say, complications, but also food for thought. So it's, well, I think for me, it kind of helps me to get a completely new viewpoint on things. Thanks a lot for this short interview, Muna. The next session I attended was on the other of my favorite topic, which is visualization. And um, I actually chaired that uh, session. And uh, the first speaker here is someone that you already had here on uh, heard here on the podcast as well uh, Zach Krivenek and he made a very very nice presentation about the power of visualization and the future of visualization and what we as a function can do about it we also had two great case studies by colleagues from Bayer presented um, they also emphasize very much what you can do in the safety space um, to visualize data. And they even had some audio features in it, which I found really, really interesting. So, so um, when you see how the uh, AEs come and go over time, uh, there was um, they had audio features in it when these uh, AEs actually occur so that you don't miss out if something changes in your data. So um, very, very kind of sophisticated graphs and uh, they implemented them in R and these are actually available. So just check out the um, conference program at psiweb.org there you will find a link to the conference and the science scientific program of it if you click on these different sessions you will see um, who presented there as well as the abstract so you know who to contact there the last session of the conference is always a regulatory uh, session, a regulatory um, question and answer session. So throughout the conference and before the conference, you were able to submit questions. And so we had a couple of different uh, people from regulatory there on the podium. And it was a really, really interesting uh, discussion, one of which was of course, about estimates, uh, which <laughs> is a pretty hot topic, of course. And 
I found it really interesting. There was one thing mentioned about cardiovascular studies where sometimes it's not completely clear whether it's a safety event or whether it's a efficacy event um, because these things, you know, go into each other. And of course, that um, maybe helps you think about similarity between estimates for um, benefit and estimates for risks, not in kind of two different ways, but more kind of think about them, linking them to each other. Um, They also mentioned that in terms of estimates, it's really important to have an open discussion. And what I found particularly interesting, it was a remark that the estimate doesn't need to always fit into the five existing categories. And if you want to deviate from it, you can, you just need to explain it very, very good. Um, another, um, topic was about consistency across studies. So um, for the same indication, um, we should strive to establish something like consistency across the different studies. I think that would also from a commercialization point of view, from a kind of medical understanding point of view uh, would help a lot if we could establish for certain kind of indications, um, we could establish, you know, some kind of standard approaches, how to uh, analyze these things and how to interpret uh, different um, estimates. Another topic, um, pretty big topic, was about um, basket umbrella platform studies. Um, And it was a couple of times repeated that these terms are not necessarily clearly defined. So don't focus too much on these terms, focus more on the features of the studies. And one quote from the regulatory session was was really a highlight for me was, remember, p-value is not the holy grail. It's not the end of the story. So p-value is not the holy grail. I, I think that is really, really important because we as statisticians sometimes overestimate that. And maybe our medical colleagues do that even more. There were some discussions about uh, Bayesian analysis in phase three. And the regulators made it pretty clear that they don't see a need for that as the phase three study needs to stand on its own. It's a confirmatory uh, trial. So all the frequentist approaches that we currently have are completely sufficient for that. Another topic was about subgroup analysis. Um, Describe why you do subgroup analysis. explain if there's kind of some standard uh, expectations on certain subgroups for a specific disease because they are analyzed always Um, and also state whether there's kind of specific prior knowledge about it, a prior belief uh, based on some data that you have seen. So that is also very, very important. Um, Okay. And with that, I want to end. It was a great, great conference. And if you have missed it this year, make sure to prepare in time for next year's conference. If you want to give a presentation, if you want to present a poster, think about the topics. Maybe you can already, you know, work about them, finalize them so that you are able to uh, submit these uh, in the second half of this year. So it makes it easier for you to attend next year's conference. Thanks and goodbye. See you next week. We thank PSI for sponsoring this show. Thanks for listening. Please visit theeffectivestatistician.com to find the show notes and learn more about our podcast 
to boost your career as a statistician in the health sector. If you enjoyed the show, please tell your colleagues about it.